Hello everybody and welcome to the Tuesday edition of Video Clips and just a couple of announcements. It's only five weeks away, the start of the Diet and Lifestyle Intervention course with instructors like Dr. John McDougall, Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Barnard, Dr. Ralph Moss, Dr. Larry Polovsky. It's an all-star cast, including me, and you get 39 continuing education hours for doctors, nurses, and uh, for dietitians. so you don't want to miss it. And then next week starts our new schedule. I'm so excited about this, where we are posting one workshop almost every single week on the members' website. And uh, the first two weeks in May, uh, May 7th, we're posting a gardening video, how to till and plant and what to plant, and where to plant it, and what the sun needs to look like and all that kind of stuff in Gary's backyard. You're gonna to get to see Gary's backyard garden, which is beautiful, by the way, and you'll learn a lot of cool stuff. And then on the 14th, I've interviewed Howard Jacobson, the guy who co-authored Whole and uh, The Low Carb Fraud with Dr. Campbell. So really fascinating interview. You will enjoy it and you just go to the member site, log on and you'll see where these workshops are. And uh, so we'll have a new one almost every week, like I said, we can use video doing it this way, which is really fun and exciting. So I have two topics to talk about today, um, both of which we talk about a lot, but there's so much confusion because I get, I know it because I get emails and inquiries every single day and in my conversations with members, it comes up all the time. So first I wanna talk about uh, vitamin D. And it is becoming increasingly clear that in many, if not most cases, low vitamin D levels are the result of illness, not the cause. This is a very important distinction, and it explains why so many intervention studies where patients have been given vitamin D as a supplement didn't really show much result. Now, a new study confirms this idea, and I think it's pretty interesting. 88 patients who visited an emergency room due to acute hyperglycemia, real high sugar levels, were tested for vitamin D levels at the time that they were admitted and then after their blood glucose levels were normalized between 12 to 18 hours after the first test was done. Um, at, uh, serum levels rose from an average of 12.3 at the time of admission to an average of 28.3 after blood glucose levels were normalized. And all of the patients, 100% of them, showed increases in vitamin D levels during that period of time, that 12 to 18 hour window. Now, obviously they weren't outside in the sun, they weren't given supplements, they were just stabilized in terms of their blood sugar levels. And um, so had these patients shown up in a doctor's office and had a blood test, they would have been diagnosed with low vitamin D and prescribed supplementation. This goes on every day in doctor's offices all over the United States. And it would have been an inappropriate diagnosis and an inappropriate plan of action because the cause of the low vitamin D levels was the very high sugar levels. Now, what's happened out there, you know, we, we sometimes want to criticize traditional medical doctors for hanging on to bad ideas, but my gosh, the alternative docs are just as good at it. Vitamin D's become a big distraction, and the testing uh, for vitamin D levels and the prescribing of supplements has become a big business. The labs are making money, uh, the doctors are making money, and the supplement companies are cleaning up. The patients are the ones who suffer. They spend money on useless, pill useless pills. They often experience side effects because the doses are real high. Uh, they avoid sunlight because they think that you're supposed to take vitamin D and fortified foods and pills. And by the way, sunlight is the best way to produce vitamin D. It's how we were designed and engineered. And um, the underlying causes of their problems often go completely not addressed at all. They're not being talked to about diet to resolve their, their issues. In the case of these people with hyperglycemia, diet is how you fix that. Healthy people tend to have normal vitamin D levels and unhealthy people tend to have low levels. Levels generally return to normal when those diseases are addressed properly and supplementation really should be reserved for a very tiny percentage of the population that can actually benefit. People who are in kidney failure, you know, people who are confined to beds in nursing homes. But this uh, mass prescribing of supplementation to the general population is just a bad idea. All right, the other topic we talk about all the time anymore is mammography. And the good news is that the, the growing body of evidence showing that mammography is a bad idea is becoming so huge and it's, there's so much of it and new things come out every day that even traditional medical journals are starting to publish articles and discussions that acknowledge that this is the case. A new review of 50 years of breast cancer screening data in the Journal of the American Medical Association concluded that a woman's decision to have a mammogram, quote, should be individualized based on patient's risk profiles and preferences. 
Now this review included 450 articles published between 1960 and 2014. The conclusion, was the, the, the conclusion that they reached was that the chance of benefiting from mammography was modest and the risks of being harmed by screening significant. Those are the terms that they used in the, in the article. The researchers encouraged clinicians to, quote, focus on informed screening decisions. An accompanying editorial essentially agreed, and while stating that discussions about screening should include information about a woman's actual risk profile, they acknowledged that, quote, the current ability to estimate individual risk is imprecise, end of quote. They further stated that benefits have been overstated and harms are greater than anticipated, and then this quote, yet that nuanced balance is not easily communicated. Now, it seems to me that this really doesn't have to be so difficult. If you look at the data in this analysis, it says a 40 or 50 year old woman who has mammograms for 10 years has a 61% risk of a false positive. Additionally, 19% of the cancers, if we wanna call them that, are actually, uh, that are diagnosed during that period of time are actually not cancers and represent over treatment. In other words, mammograms are more likely to hurt you than help you, so don't have one. How's that for some clear communication? Of course, those with a vested interest have a different idea about this. The American College of Radiology and the Society of Breast Imaging, these people make their money on mammography, issued a press release essentially regurgitating the same information they've used to hurt women for decades, that not having mammograms will result in more breast cancer deaths. These groups are counting on the fact that they can scare women into continuing to have mammograms regardless of the evidence. It's worked in the past, but their days may be numbered as more truthful information reaches more consumers through groups like the Wellness Forum. The degree to which the groups are willing to misrepresent research studies in order to perpetuate their lies to women is almost hard to imagine. And in fact, one of the researchers, Dr. Nancy Keating, commented on this saying, selective reporting results only from, uh, selectively reporting results only from the studies that showed the biggest benefit of mammography doesn't accurately reflect the larger body of research on screening mammography. In other words, these people cherry pick evidence to make their point and they really don't report the uh, preponderance of the evidence. Both authors of the study encouraged informed decision-making using, quote, decision aids. These are things like pamphlets and videos and internet tools. Studies have shown that these help patients to understand risks and benefits and consistently lead to fewer women deciding to have mammograms. The Cochrane Collaboration, which has been fighting to get the truth out about mammograms for a very long time, has developed just such a tool to inform women, and it's actually included in Peter Gotchi's book uh, that I covered a couple years ago, Mammography, Truth, Lies, and Controversy. Now, how could any reasonable person disagree with the idea of providing objective information to women about screening? A lot of people do object to using an, a, a screening tool like the one that Gotchi uh, includes in his book. Well, the objection is due to the fact that information causes people to make better decisions and those decisions are bad for business. It's up to all of us to talk very, very loudly about all of these types of things until everybody knows the truth. The truth is very bad for business, but it is a whole lot better for human health. All right, that's all for today. And uh, as usual, feel free to pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it. Feel free to post comments. I enjoy responding to you guys when you do that. And I will be back to you again on Thursday.